Ernest Rutherford is most famous for discovering the nucleus in his gold foil experiment, but he did so much more than that, even before he discovered the nucleus. He discovered that there are different kinds of radiation, found elements can decay into other elements, found a new radioactive element, discovered that radioactivity decays with a half-life, and used these facts to discover that the Earth was hundreds of millions of years older than people thought it was. And he did all this with basically tin cans and cigar boxes. Not bad for a poor kid from nowhere New Zealand. Ready for the story of a charismatic, influential, and ridiculously prolific scientist? Let's go! Electricity, electricity. Ernest Rutherford's life changed in July of 1895 when a man named J.C. McLaren got married. Why did that change Rutherford's life? Well, McLaren had just won a scholarship to travel abroad, but the marriage invalidated the scholarship, so it went to the scholarship's only other applicant, 24-year-old Rutherford. Supposedly, when Rutherford got the news, he was working on the family farm, threw down his shovel, exclaiming, that's the last potato I'll ever dig. Ernest Rutherford, earned to family and friends, was born in 1871 in New Zealand and was a fourth child out of 12 of a poor Scottish farmer and an English school teacher. Ern always excelled at school, but he was also a rough and tumble country boy who enjoyed rugby and fishing. His mother insisted that all knowledge is power, although Rutherford put it as, we didn't have the money, so we had to think. With the help of scholarships, Rutherford got bachelor's and master's degrees in math and science. He didn't become an engineer. There were only 126 engineers in New Zealand at the time, but he decided to become a school teacher, which was not a success. A former student recalled, he was entirely hopeless as a schoolmaster and disorder prevailed in his classes. When a student was sent out for misbehaving, they only had to stay out of the classroom long enough for Rutherford's enormous mind to have bulged in some other direction sneak back to his seat and he would inevitably not be noticed. While in college, Ernst stayed at a boarding house and he eventually fell in love with the landlady's daughter, Mary Newton. In 1894, Ernst asked Mary for her hand in marriage, but Mary refused as she didn't want to be a handicap to his education, saying it, quote, would be idiotic to get married. However, she would wait for him, telling Rutherford, I wouldn't dream of marrying anyone else. Free from marriage, Rutherford won the scholarship I mentioned in the beginning of the video. Now he had the funds to travel anywhere in the world, and he decided to go to England, as J.J. Thompson, the head of Cavendish Laboratories in Cambridge, had just changed the rules to let aliens, or non-Cambridge graduates, go to graduate school there. Rutherford was hired on the spot, and Rutherford found his boss to be, quote, very pleasant and not fossilized at all. However, Rutherford found his fellow students to be another matter. Writing Mary, they treated him and fellow student John Townsend, who was Irish, quite badly. Quote, they snigger at us. I'd like to do a Maori war dance on the chest of one, and we'll do that in the future if things don't mend. However, he was quickly asked to do a public talk, and once again he wrote Mary. Quote, my paper before the physical society was a heavy blow to their assumed superiority, and now they all offer to help us in any way they can. Rutherford arrived in England at quite the opportune time. Just months after his arrival, on January 5th, 1896, the papers carried a strange story that vacuum tubes called Crookes tubes could make powerful invisible rays called X-rays. Soon, as Rutherford recalled years later, every laboratory in the world took out its old Crookes tubes to produce X-rays, and Cavendish Laboratory was no exception. Rutherford had been working on transmitting signals using radio waves, but was convinced by J.J. Thompson to study the effect of x-rays on gases. Meanwhile in France, a wealthy third-generation scientist named Henri Becquerel had found that uranium would spontaneously produce rays that, like x-rays, could go through thick paper and develop film. In 1897, a Polish immigrant to France named Marie Skladowska Curie decided to study uranium rays for her dissertation. Curie also found that thorium produced these rays and named the process radioactivity. She also found that there must be tiny amounts of incredibly radioactive material, polonium and radium, hidden in the ore. When Rutherford heard about Curie's results, he decided that since he'd been studying the effect of x-rays on gases, he might as well study the effect of radioactivity on gases. 
Rutherford thus put a bit of uranium on a plate separated by another plate by air and measured the current that flowed between the plates as a measure of the radioactivity, a method he copied from Marie Curie. However, Marie Curie was studying the uranium and Rutherford wanted to study the radioactive rays. Therefore, Rutherford added layers of thin metal foil in the way of the uranium rays to see what happened to the strength of the radiation. The results were very strange. At first, the thin layers of metal would quickly diminish the strength of the current, but then after a while, the amount seemed almost constant. What was going on? On September 1st, 1898, Rutherford published his conclusion. Quote, uranium radiation is complex, and there are present at least two distinct types of radiation. One that is readily absorbed, which will be termed for convenience the alpha radiation, and the other of a more penetrative character, which will be termed the beta radiation. We still use those names to this day. The very next year, a physicist in France named Paul Villard was given some radium to study and discovered a third, even more powerful type of radiation, the Rutherford called gamma radiation, as alpha, beta, and gamma are the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. At the same time that Rutherford was discovering alpha and beta radiation, a professor at McGill University in Canada retired. The department heads wrote to J.J. Thompson to ask for advice. Thompson wrote back, quote, I've never had a student with more enthusiasm or ability for original research than Mr. Rutherford. Rutherford was a little hesitant to leave Cambridge, but he felt the lingering resentment against him as an outsider would keep him from getting a fellowship. And he became excited, as he put it, having, quote, a swell lab so he could knock the shine out of the Yankees. Also with this new position, he could finally get married. And he wrote his fiancée, quote, Rejoice with me, my dear girl, for matrimony is looming in the distance. Still, it took another year and a half to arrange the finances for their long-awaited marriage. Rutherford quickly attracted a crack group of young researchers to work with him. He was young, energetic, and published a ridiculous amount. For example, in 1902, he published 14 papers. Also, he always always gave credit to others for their contributions. Rutherford was also one of the few male science professors who hired women. Years later, Rutherford wrote that women contribute substantially to progress in the various branches of learning, and for this reason, no less than those of elementary justice, he welcomed the presence of women in the laboratory. In fact, one of his first acts at McGill was asking a young woman named Harriet Brooks, who had just graduated from there with a degree in science, to be his first graduate student. Brooks did important work with Rutherford, and I'll talk about some of that a little later in the video. But she left him in 1904 to become a professor at Barnard University, where she got engaged to a local physics professor. Then she was told that if she got married, she would be fired. Eventually, she broke off the relationship, but the stress caused her to leave Barnard too. She then worked with Marie Curie, and then got a scholarship to work with Rutherford again. Then an old flame from McGill found her and proposed to her. Just two years after she wrote, a woman has a right to the practice of her profession and cannot be condemned to abandon it merely because she marries. She quit physics altogether to be married. Sigh. Back in 1899, when Rutherford went to McGill, he was approached by an electrical engineer named Bobby Owen for advice on what to do to fulfill the research portion of his scholarship. Rutherford suggested studying the radiation from thorium oxide the same way Rutherford had studied the radiation from uranium. To their shock, quote, the radiation from thorium oxide was not constant, but varied in a most capricious manner. Rutherford took over the research and found that it was changing because of the air currents in the room. But that was crazy. No radiation would move hither and thither with the breeze. Rutherford decided that the thorium must have been emanating a gas that was being pushed by the air, and this gas must be radioactive. Rutherford then came up with an ingenious way of studying the radiation from the gas. He put some thorium oxide in a long tube and blew filtered air over the thorium to blow the radioactive gas into an electroscope. He then turned off the air and measured the intensity of the radioactivity of the gas as a function of time. To his surprise, the gas lost radioactivity in a matter of minutes. In fact, no matter how much gas they had, it always decreased by two over a set amount of time, around one minute. This was the discovery of the half-life of radioactive materials. They soon found that everything radioactive decreased by two over a set amount of time. 
but that amount of time varied widely. I forgot to mention in my video about Marie Curie and the discovery of radium, but even before it was fully isolated, radium took the scientific world by storm. Even low quality radium would glow and create heat and burn fingers endlessly without any input source or apparent change in shape. In 1901, a chemist named Friedrich Giesel used Madame Curie's method to make pure radium and put it on the market. Rutherford was first in line and immediately bought 30 milligrams for 30 pounds, around $10,000 in today's market, or to put it another way, 30 pounds out of his 500 pounds a year paycheck. Diesel then upped the price 12 times, making himself a fortune and also making radium out of the range for almost any laboratory. As radium salt was about a million times more radioactive than uranium, it dramatically changed what Rutherford could study. For example, the Curies had reported that radium would, like thorium, produce radioactive gas, although this radioactive gas would last for weeks. However, Rutherford lamented that, quote, the specimens of impure radium then in my possession did not possess the power of emitting such an emanation. Now with pure radium, Harriet Brooks, Rutherford's graduate student, remember her? had emanations from radium to examine. Brooks and Rutherford concluded that these emanations were not a vapor of radium, but a new radioactive element with a different mass. Now alchemists have been trying to change one element into another, usually gold for thousands of years, but no one knew that radioactive materials were just naturally decaying into other elements all on their own. This was a radical result. However, at first the Curies disagreed with their results and most other scientists merely ignored them. In March of 1901, Rutherford debated the existence of electrons with a young chemist named Frederick Soddy. After the debate, Rutherford and Soddy decided to work together. Soddy decided to use chemistry to study the gas that was emanating from the thorium oxide. He tried to make it react to anything and it wouldn't, which gave him the idea that it must be a noble gas. He started to be convinced it was the newly discovered argon gas. Saudi recalled, quote, I remember quite well standing there transfixed as though stunned by the colossal import of the thing and blurting out, Rutherford, the thorium is disintegrating and transmuting itself into an argon gas. Rutherford replied, for Mike's sake, Saudi, don't call it transmutation. They'll have our heads off as alchemists. Make a transformation. These seem like more conclusive results and the Curies were convinced. Pretty soon everyone believed in the transformation view of radiation. By the way, it took until Frederick Soddy realized the existence of isotopes years later that they realized that the emanation from radium and the emanation from thorium were both isotopes of the same gas, radon. Rutherford then came up with a really interesting way to use the half-life of radioactive materials and their transformation from one element and isotope into another. Rutherford figured if you knew how much radioactivity a material had, what it decayed into, how much of that material it had, and how long it decayed from one object to another, you could figure out how old the object was. Rutherford tested out on a piece of pitch blend ore and found that the ore was about 700 million years old. This was totally shocking, as at the time they thought the Earth was 100 million years old. It took another 50 years or so, but this method, called radiometric dating, is what was used to determine the currently accepted age of the Earth, around 4.5 billion years old. Rutherford was incredibly successful at McGill, but still felt rather out of things in Canada, complaining to J.J. Thompson that, quote, this feeling of isolation is a great drawback to colonial appointments. Finally, in 1907, Rutherford was awarded a position at the University of Manchester, which happens to be J.J. Thompson's alma mater, and happily went back to the UK. The next year, Rutherford was shocked to win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for, quote, investigations into the disintegration of the elements and the chemistry of radioactive substances. Unlike the Curies, however, Rutherford loved the attention and wrote that he and his wife had the time of our lives in Sweden. Also, five years later, he was knighted, and he told his 13-year-old daughter, Eileen, quote, Henceforth, young lady, you may address me as Sir Ernest. At the same time Rutherford got his Nobel Prize, he was working on an experiment shooting alpha particles at a gold foil. Although Rutherford was known to bellow, don't let me catch anyone talking about the universe in my department, 
Rutherford was about to upend our understanding of reality and cause a lot of deep discussions about the universe, for he was about to discover the nucleus. And that story is next time on The Lightning Tamers. Thanks for watching my video. You might have noticed that I didn't mention Rutherford's most famous expression, all science is either physics or stamp collecting. I actually looked into it and I found some interesting things about it. I don't think he was insulting other sciences. I think he was insulting theoreticians. It actually makes sense, or at least to me. If you're interested, I have a link down below. Also, speaking of links down below, I started a Patreon page, so why don't you click on it and join my Patreon page and be part of the community. You'll get early views of my videos, you'll get background videos, you'll get lots of things as, as soon as I think of what I'm going to give you on my Patreon page and you get my everlasting thanks. If you are too broke or not interested in donating to me, you can still help out. Why don't you give me a thumbs up, subscribe, make a comment, or share it on social media. All of that is good. Okay, have a nice day.